Hi, this is Dr. David Peterzell, and I'm here with Tom Rutledge of UCSD Psychiatry, and we're going to be talking about various theories of pain, including things like gait theory and how that's revolutionized the treatment of pain for us, the people like us who are clinical psychologists. Tom? Yeah, gait control theory is, is an interesting theory for psychology because it's, it's one of those theories that has really stood the test of time. That um, gait control theory was developed, I guess, way back in the mid 1960s by a psychologist by the name of Ron Melzack, and with some minor modifications, it really exists today in much the same form as it did then. And to understand how important gait control theory is, one really has to think about what the current theory of the time was back in the 1960s where things was pretty much a medical model where pain was essentially dis was thought of as something that was directly correlated with say the degree of injury and so understanding a person's pain was primarily based upon what you could see upon objective test results for example if you could see a broken bone see damage to the spine see other sorts of either soft or hard tissue injury and if that wasn't there then the credibility of the pain of the patient's pain report was also rather suspect. And, uh, so, for example, in the, in the 1960s, uh, unusual pain reports, things like phantom limb pain, for example, were thought to be purely a psychiatric phenomena. There wasn't really a, a good medical model for understanding how a person could experience pain like that. Right. So it's almost like you know, they just thought, okay, if the nociceptors are damaged, then there's a labeled line that's going to go straight to the brain. And something like phantom limb pain didn't make any sense because the nociceptors were gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pain was primarily a sort of a, neurologi a neurological phenomenon from nociceptors, pain receptors in the body. And the brain, and in particular the mind, wasn't really thought to be all that terribly important as, as it, unless it was simply the something that received the messages. But it did, wasn't necessarily meant or thought of as playing a major role in the person's actual experience of pain. And so that's where gate control theory had a dramatic impact and that it sort of open the door not only to kind of a non-purely strict medical model of, of understanding a person's pain experience, but also opening the door to the variety of other other disciplines that we, in, in modern day times, think of as, as simply a routine part of a patient's pain management care. And so when you talk about these other disciplines, can you say more about that? Well, obviously, for example, that would include mental health folks. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, gay control theory talks about the idea that uh, patient's pain experience is not only a product and part of their of the type of damage or tissue damage or uh, tissue injury that they might be experiencing, but a variety of social factors, emotional factors, other mood-related factors, uh, and, and so forth that can also uh, cause a person to experience more or less pain given the exact same level of injury. And it also gives uh, credibility to psychiatric and psychological interventions. For example, again, in the 1960s, going in and doing relaxation training or cognitive interventions and so forth, even when a patient responded well to it, that it would, the most uh, medical professionals, for example, would sort of roll their eyes because there really wasn't a compelling theory for why this should have any real effect. And to the, to the extent that a patient did respond to it, it was interpreted more or less as a reinforcement that the patient's pain was psychological all along. Right, whereas now we actually have a, a, a physiological model. I think what it says something along the lines that those thick fibers get stimulated and they can actually shut off the entire transmission of pain or some of it. Mm -hmm. So we know now that the biological factors involved in, in pain as well as the psychiatric and, and, and social factors that are involved in pain all are working at the same time and that these can be, these are happening in any given instance for a pain, for a pain patient, but they're also something that uh, practitioners from different interventions can, can specifically intervene on to manipulate, preferably in the, the direction of lowering a person's pain experience. So this is a biopsychosocial model of pain, is that what would you call it that? Gate control theory is really what allowed for a biopsychosocial model of pain to exist. Until this theory came around and gained credibility that there were mental health professionals dabbling and then there was a mainstream medical model, but there really wasn't a way for us to gain entrance simply because we didn't have any, again, scientific credibility. This gave us a, a model and a theory for understanding why it works, why patients were reporting the things that they were reporting, and allowed for uh, revolutions in new pain treatments such as phantom limb pain, because now phantom limb pain was treated as a as a, a viable medical pain entity as opposed to something that was purely psychiatric. Right. So it had 
a very profound changes on the field. So if you could talk about some of the leading edge approaches that get control. I mean, so you've mentioned some of them, but so now today in 2009, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the best pain interventions that you use from your perspective? So the, the gold standard in chronic pain treatment these days are multidisciplinary models. And again, it's built on the same idea. So for example, when a patient has a back injury now, rather than just sending them off to a medical practitioner, that instead they're often placed in more of a rehabilitation center where they're seeing a physical therapist, a, a rehabilitation physician, uh, occupational, uh, recreational therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, etc. So there's a whole team of providers, all of which, based upon a model like a control theory, now have uh, avenues where they're both working together as well as having uh, unique opportunities for benefits. Wonderful. Great. Do you have any other pain theories that come to mind before we sign off? Well, the mainstream medical model itself is more of a stepped care approach where, uh, for example, the typical pain patient, even though I mentioned the idea that the, the sort of the gold standard of care is to have this multidisciplinary treatment model where patients are working very actively with a number of different disciplines, it's still the typical patient's experience that they start off seeing a medical provider and until they have sort of exhausted the routine, uh, relatively uh, quick and easy medical interventions, uh, they don't go into those multidisciplinary models. So early on, for example, if, if you or I had a back injury, we'd probably just see our pain doc. They would do the MRIs, x-rays, look for opportunities for surgeries, um, short-term rehabilitation through physical therapy, those kinds of treatments. So there's still a lot of interest these days in perhaps preventing chronic pain from developing in the first place. And the thought is that, that uh, better intervening, better capturing some of these guys when they're, they're experiencing what's still called uh, acute pain at that phase, that multidisciplinary treatments, even at that, you could be equipping people with coping skills, lifestyle changes, etc. that unfortunately now they're only getting usually after they're deemed chronic, but helping these guys be better equipped beforehand that could then potentially prevent a healthy percentage of them from even transitioning into that chronic model uh, to begin with. Great. So, so if somebody wanted to go into the field of pain treatment, you mentioned a number of, ver of various disciplines. Would you? So, if somebody wanted to go into clinical psychology, they they'd specialize in pain treatment, for instance. And oh, time out. <laughs> That's probably him right there.